Hello and welcome to Simcha, a celebration of life. I'm your host, Aaron Halevi. When Moses finished setting up the Mishkan, or tabernacle, he anointed and consecrated it in all its furnishings, including the altar and its utensils. Then the heads of families who were the 12 tribal leaders of Israel made offerings at the dedication of the Mishkan. In our series, Righteous Men and Women of the Bible, Rabbi Sean Cannon focuses on Nathaniel, leader of the tribe of Yisachar. Yisachar, or Yisachar in English, um, was perhaps um, one of the lesser known sons of Jacob. Doesn't get as much coverage time in the Torah. Um, but one of the chieftains, one of the leaders of the tribe of Yisachar, his name was Nisanel. And Nisanel brought the offering at the dedication of the Mishkan. Now just to give some context to this, the Mishkan was the portable temple that essentially followed the Jewish people during their sojourn in the desert. So this was the predecessor. This was generation model number one of the, uh, of the temple. And it used to go around with the Jewish people. So at the inauguration, every one of the 12 tribes, which is represented by the 12 sons of Jacob, each tribe brings its own gift for the inauguration. And with much pomp and ceremony and excitement amongst the whole Jewish people, we're now going to have an opportunity to serve God on a much higher level and have our Mishkan. And the first leader of the first tribe was a, a Jewish leader by the name of Nachshon. And Nachshon was from the tribe of Yehuda, of Judah. And Nachshon's gift was a series of, ju of, of, of jewelry, a gold and silver bowl of various animals that would be used in the sacrificial services in the Mishkan. And it was a whole series of gifts that were given. And that would have cost a lot of money of pure gold and pure silver in those days, would have cost a lot of money and was a substantial gift as an inauguration of the Mishkan, or, or in Hebrew what we would call the Chanukah Hamizbeach. So the next tribe steps up to the plate to give its gift. And this is where Nathanel or Nathanel uh, really steps up to the plate and he is, as I said before, a less known leader of the Jewish people, but yet has a take home message that I think is profound and something we can all learn from. Nathanel had a moral dilemma because he was representing his tribe and he was next to give a gift. So what's the natural disposition, the natural tendency, is that you want to give the best possible gift from your tribe because you're representing your entire tribe as your part in the makeup of the Jewish people. So there's a tendency to give the best and it's for, it's for God, it's for Hashem in the end of the day. So why not give the best? But now Nisanel had to make a choice. Does he give more than what Nachshon, his predecessor from the tribe of Judah gave? Does he give less? That's going to then reflect poorly. You know, why is the tribe of Yisachar giving a much lesser gift? Or if they give more, why are they giving more? Or if they're giving the same, why are they giving the same? So this was all running through Netanel's head as he was preparing the gifts to give at the inauguration of the Mishkan. Just to give a, a, a backdrop of, of context over here on, on what Yisachar's role really was, Metaphorically, the tribe of Yisachar is called a donkey. He's called a beast of burden because a donkey actually carries a load on its strong shoulders. And Yisachar's job was actually to carry the load of Torah learning. And Torah study is not easy. You know, for anyone who's studied for examinations or, or a formal assessment of sorts, you know that you study and you study and it's, it takes its toll on someone and it's a, it brings with a lot of fatigue. But Yisachar's special job as the one of the 12 tribes was specifically to be able to learn the Torah on its highest level so that it could, um, it could continue from generation to generation. And those from the tribe of Yisachar were actually really the Torah teachers. And they would also deal with some of the most complex questions that would come up in Jewish law. Everyone would know you would go to the tribe of Yisachar for the, for the answers. They were the sages, essentially. 
So it's interesting, he knew that as the backdrop on the one hand, that he was representing the sort of the sagely tribe. Um, but on the other hand, he had a job to do, which was to give a gift at the inauguration of the Mishkan, of the temporary temple. And he now needed to, and, and we know that all the spiritual energy, you know, our sages teach us that that which goes after the beginning, everything comes after that. Just like we have the concept in the creation of the world with Berei Shit, which means in the beginning that everything, all the physical and spiritual coding of the world is contained always at its inception. We know that even from ourselves in the procreation of man and woman, we know that initial fertilization of sperm and egg, everything's actually contained right at that inception, right at that beginning point. And everything that comes after that in the development of a human being is just a manifestation of that original genetic coding, that original inception, that original beginning. So therefore, Yisachar knew, I've got to get it right at the start. So when it came time for Netanel to bring his gift representing the tribe of Yisachar, he brought the identical gift in all its shape and form. The same gold, the same silver, the same animals. He brought the same gift. Why would he do that? In fact, our commentator on the Torah, the Orachayim, says a fascinating idea. Says inherently in his heart, he wanted to give more. He wanted to give the best. In fact, he was going to go to the coffers of the tribe and give everything. That's how much he wanted to give. That's how important he knew this beginning, this beret shit of the um, inauguration of the Mishkan was. But he held back. Why did he hold back? So says the Orachayim, no, the reason he gave the identical gift in all its shape and form was because he knew he was second and there was going to be a third tribe and a fourth tribe and a fifth tribe and a sixth tribe and a twelfth tribe who would all have to bring their gifts. And if he upped the ante, even by one iota, by one piece of silver, then he would be putting pressure on the next person who would think to himself, well, I'm leading the tribe of Zivulun, and perhaps I need to now show that I'm giving more than tribe number one and more than tribe number two, and he would be under immense material pressure. And so Nisanel really is a small Jewish hero, much unknown, but a real hero. And Nisanel taught us a lesson not to look over the wall of your neighbor, not to say, am I keeping up with the Joneses? He gave the exact, exact same gift so that he knew that person number three would then in turn, the pressure would be off and he would give the exact same gift. And that's in fact what happened. Every single tribe then in turn gave the identical gift. But ultimately what Nisanel brought to the table was to show us that he took the pressure off the rest of the Jewish people. The, the pressures of life are such that the strains of making a living are as tough enough as they are and therefore just have an opportunity here to take your foot off the gas. And the Tanel really goes down as a Jewish hero to say that something very, dis materiality is nothing neither very positive nor negative. It can be used in tremendously positive ways as we see that gold and silver and material things were an integral part of the building blocks of the Mishkan and of Hashem's presence in the world. But that is not an excuse to create a society or to create a pressure where everybody feels that they have to chase their tails and work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just to keep up with the material standards of everybody else. Welcome back. Continuing our series on righteous men and women of the Bible, Rebetzin of Eva Thurgood tells us the story of Hannah, mother of the great prophet Shmuel or Samuel, whose teachings demonstrate that through prayer, almost anything is possible. We're going to talk about Hannah. Hannah is the mother of Samuel, Shmuel, one of the most famous prophets in the Bible, in Tanakh. She was a lady who really struggled to have children. She was married for many years to a man called Elchanah. He was also married to another lady, Penina. Penina was actually given to Elchanah by Elchanah in the hopes that by giving him a wife, she would merit to have children of her own. Penina had seven children and Hannah never had any. 
We are told that Penina taunted Hana, that she made her life difficult, reminding her constantly that she didn't have children. We are told in the Gemara that what she actually was trying to do is something called in Hebrew an Avera Lishma, a sin with the purpose of creating something good. Very difficult because often your intention doesn't always give a good end to the means. But in Penina's situation, she felt that Hana wasn't praying enough, that Hana had felt that just by giving Penina to her husband, she would marry to have children. And she really wanted her to, doubt, to pray from a deep, a depth in her heart that she really wanted her to feel pain and desperation and in that merit to be able to have a child. Hannah is associated with prayer. In fact, we are told that most of the silent prayer that we do today is based on how she prayed when she asked for a child. So Shmuel Aleph, Samuel, the first chapter, starts off with us being told that Hannah and her son and her husband, Elchanah, Penina and her children, are traveling to the tabernacle. At the time, the Jewish people didn't have Jerusalem, and so they didn't have a temple yet, but they had a traveling tabernacle. In Hebrew, it was known as the Mishkan. And three times a year, for Pesach on Passover, for Shavuot and Sukkot, people would come and bring sacrifices and connect with God. They also would come and bring people from all over. It was really like a, a festival, and people would come up and connect together. Hannah always saw this as an opportunity to come and pray. And we are told that she is praying for a child, that she comes to the Mishkan, to the tabernacle, and she is in so much pain and so much distress that her lips are moving without any words coming out. And the priest, the high priest, the Kohen Gadol at the time, his name's Eli, he looks at her and he assumes she's drunk, and he actually chases her away because he'd never seen prayer like this. Today, so often we think of prayer as being silent, don't we? And we internalize it that way. We don't think of loud shouting. It's a very, it's a very pure place to come from when you, when you pray with your lips silently. That is not for everyone to hear, just God. And really, Hannah was the first person to ever do this. Hannah tells Ailey that she's bitter, that she doesn't have children. She believed that she would create a child that would really connect to God and really shows God's light in this world. She didn't want just a child, she wanted a special child. And she says to Ailey, she can't understand why God won't give her this child. She is so desperate that she even starts bargaining with God. Ailey hears her plan, pain and gives her a blessing that she will, will be able to merit to have a child. But Hannah also makes a promise to God. And she says, if you give me a child, I will give him to the temple, I will give him to you. So we said that Hannah's prayer is really the foundation of how we often pray today. And so we need to look at some of the words of her prayer to understand what we're doing today. And really, her, her key, she found the right key for that unlocking prayer. And so if there's something that you desire, something that you want, it's important to find that key so that you too can unlock the blessings that are found in prayer. So the first thing we have to understand is her prayer came from a place of pain. When we pray, we often just stand before God and might verbalize something. If you pray three times a day, if you pray five times a day, if you pray once a day, if you never pray, on the odd occasion you might. But when you come to God, you often just mouth the words. And what we see with Hannah is that she cries. She really comes from a place of pain. And what we understand from that coming from a place of pain is that connection. Prayer is not just about acknowledging what you need, but acknowledging where it comes from. It says that she prayed on God and she prayed on her heart. And those words on means that it came from the very depths of her heart, that she really had that pain and despair. And coming praying on God, she calls herself a maidservant of God. She understands that even though she is a powerful woman, that really blessing and prayer can only be answered through God. What I also liked, and I think I'd like you to take from it as well, is that Hannah asks for everything. She doesn't hold back. She doesn't just ask for a child. She asks for a son. She asks for a special child. She asks for almost the full package. So really, when you're praying before God, it's not just about asking for the smallest of what you need. You're not asking a person. You're asking something that really is the source of blessing. So go for gold. And we see that Hannah merits to have Samuel. Samuel is born. She keeps him for two years. And as she promises, she hands him over to the tabernacle at the time. And Samuel's an incredible being. He's one of the greatest prophets of our time. And while the dynasty of David and Solomon really were the creators of the temple, 
the Beit HaMikdash, and what really created the unity of the Jewish people, it was really Shmuel, Samuel, who found them and who anoints them and who directs them through everything that they do. Something I've thought about with Hannah often is she prays for so long for this child. She is desperate for this child. We see all the bargaining and all the pleading that she does. And she, she gets the perfect son. She really does. She gets Samuel. And she only has him for two years. She keeps her promise to God and hands him over, which must have been incredibly difficult. She does visit him. She does visit him. She brings him clothes. She brings him food. But it's not the same as having a child at home. And if you think of a two-year-old, you're only just starting to enjoy a two-year-old. You know, there's so many years ahead. But I think maybe, and this is my opinion, but maybe why, what made it easier is that we're not told inside, but we are, we are told through commentaries that she did merit to have another six children. And so perhaps even, this is really my suggestion, but perhaps the fact that she kept her promise and gave Samuel to back to God, so to speak, in, in, in the form of handing over to the temple, she merited to have the next six easily and without a problem. Renowned Jewish musicians Jonathan Rizal and Alex Clare were both recently in South Africa for Sinai and Daba. Local producer Matthew Klawanski got them into studio where they collaborated on a version of Rabbi Shlomo Karlibach's song, Yachad. The recording was then sent around the world and after adding performances by a diverse bunch of Jewish musos, including My Lucky Self, it was mixed all together into the theme song for Shabbat Project 2015. <laughs> The Shabbos project really created an amazing, an amazingly positive spirit that musicians from around the world wanted to connect to. This gave us a unique opportunity. We knew that there was something that we could do there, but we didn't really know what it would be. So we started throwing ideas around and came up with this idea of a collaborative mashup. <laughs> So this song, it's called Yachad. It was written by Rabbi Shlomo Kalabach. I think it's Yachad means unity. The actual word of the song means unity. I think if anybody knows how to write a song about unity, it would be Rabbi Shlomo. He would, you know, travel the world playing music for different Jews everywhere, bring people together. Um, the song is taken, the, the actual words are taken from the Kedusha, the Sfarad Kedusha or the Sparad Nusach of the Kedusha. So it starts off with Keser Yisnu Lach. In other words, a crown is given to Hashem. That the angels above are crowning Hashem as the king, but so too are we here down below. Then it moves into that word Yachad, which Rabbi Shlomo makes the whole song, this whole joyous tune around that one word. And that means that when we sing together below, that's how we bring glory to Hashem above. Will hear us in heaven if we sing together. Will hear us in heaven if we sing together. Will hear us in heaven if we sing The project started off in Cape Town with Alex Clare in studio there. It moved to Johannesburg with Yonatan Razel. Um, from there, it then moved to Israel with Yehuda Katz and Eliezer Botzer to Argentina with Tiembla El Mohel and Lionel Mizrahi and to Seattle with Nissen Black who's uh, put down a rap for us. Along the way it featured Aaron Turia Schwartz, my brother Isaac Levanski on the drums, Honey G and Johnny Sklar. <laughs> It was amazing for me as the producer to get these different contributions from all these artists. They all had an amazing sense of humility and sensitivity, understanding how to bring out the best in the song. And we then took each contribution and mashed it up. So we would take this element from this studio session, that element from that one, and really shape a song in that way. That's what it was. It was a mashup of all these different collaborations. Sonia So the reason we 
made the song, the purpose of it all is to bring people together. I think the Jewish world, unfortunately, is plagued by so much, um, so many rifts, so much divide between different groups of people. We wanted to bring everybody together in harmony. So music is about harmony and the Jewish people need to work together in harmony. That's what we want to do really um, express through the song and through the actual, not the music itself, but the concept of the project, bringing different people together from different parts of the world and different levels of, levels of observance. Very much like the Shabbos project is doing. For me personally, it's just been an incredible journey to get to know all these different people, to work with different people, to work in different languages. You know, there's three different languages on the song. Um, to understand the different flavors that different musicians have, and then to try to figure out a way to make it all work in harmony. It's been a great journey for me, and I hope that you all will enjoy the song as well. If you would like to be part of this exciting project, please send through video recordings of you, your family and friends singing Yachad together at landmarks in your city to partners at theshabbosproject.com or simply tag your video on Facebook to The Shabbos Project or you can WhatsApp it to 72 16 Today's Pirkei Avot comes from verse 15 in chapter 3. Rabbi Akiva would say, all is foreseen, and freedom of choice is granted. The world is judged with goodness, but in accordance with the amount of man's positive deeds. Well, that's all we have for this week's episode of Simcha, a celebration of life. As always, we'd love to hear from you, so please send us a message on Facebook at Spirit Sister Productions. From me, Aaron Halevi, and the Simcha team, have a great week ahead.